Uh, the first big story I heard was from a collector in Oregon uh, named Al Kozlowski. When um, I had I had sent him a note a couple of years ago when he sent me the copies, they had just discovered these two shows, and everybody was thrilled because there weren't that many big story episodes. Um, so it's uh, I've always had an interest in this series, and uh, a few well a couple of years ago. Matt Nunes, who's also uh, an academic researcher and, and teacher, uh, posted something on the Cobalt Club, and that started the ball rolling for, for all of this. So the, the title is The Stories Behind the Big Story, and there are very, very many. We're going to highlight a few, but and also how the series began. And uh, it was pretty amazing to me as I dug into the actual news stories, how gruesome some of them were and then how innocuous the big story made them turn out to be. Uh, it was one of the most successful radio and television crossovers in the history of the overlap of the two uh, media. Um, it, it was a hit as soon as it hit, uh, got onto to radio. And then when they moved it to television, they had uh, the overlap for quite a number of years. Uh, different stories uh, on on each one, but uh, the television program did adapt some of the radio scripts. And then uh, by 1958, they put together a syndication package. And if any of you of you have seen uh, the Big Story TV show, it's usually with Burgess Meredith, and those are the episodes that they did there. But there's uh, 381 episodes plus the the audition, and I'll, I'll talk about the audition a lot. Um, and there were 314 TV episodes, and uh, it's it's really curious to see how they played all all that out. And I'll go through the television series toward the end. We need a lot of research on this series, so if anybody wants to dig into IMDb. Uh, uh, the Internet Movie Database and some other resources. Uh, there's there's not much on the television program. There's a lot on the radio program. Uh, we need the rerun count. We need a because they kept changing the titles, and also uh, programs where the the uh, newspaper reporter actually made an appearance on the TV show. They never really made any any appearances on the radio program. The audition was called Feature Assignment, and it uh, was a little grittier than, uh, the, than the big story would actually become. Uh, the network had a policy of fictionalization that was really quite interesting. And uh, there was one of the perpetrators of a crime who actually sued them, even though the program was fictionalized. Uh, 50 programs have survived. If you go into Radio Gold Index, you'll see 29. So over the past decade, about we've gotten 11 more shows. Most of them are AFRS. We've got 47 complete, 34 of those in our network. Uh, the way we've been finding programs now has been through uh, Armed Forces radio discs. And we also have some partial network recordings. But that's not so bad because we have most all of the scripts because of the American tobacco uh, litigation. Uh, so we're one out of six or one out of eight are uh, around. Uh, there's a lot more to find. And some of these programs are just absolutely marvelous. Now, it almost could have gone to Mark Hellinger. Um, many of you know that Mark Hellinger was a producer on one of the uh, famous films is uh, High Sierra. But he was thrown out of high school and then became a journalist uh, by the time he was 20 and then a newspaper columnist. And he caught the attention of Warner Brothers and he was hired by them and that's how he got into the movies. But he never forgot the newspaper business. He was really fascinated by all of that and eventually met up with Homer Canfield from NBC who was also a former newspaper uh, columnist, and they uh, worked on this idea uh, and had a writer, Warren Lewis, who was also very interested in newspapers. So they came up with a program called The Fourth Estate. And this was an audition that was done in June of 1946, 
But if you listen to it, it sounds an awful lot like the big story. It has a lot of those elements in it, even though the audition for what would become the big story was four months before. Uh, Fourth Estate even had a sponsor and still couldn't come to air. Uh, Hellinger passed away at age 44 after the big story uh, went on the air. So he did hear his idea actually work. And Warren Lewis, we would know because he would be the writer for Nightbeat, also another newspaper program. Uh, so, uh, I have a web page uh, at the end of the presentation that you can go to and you can hear the fourth estate and you'll you'll see how what what a, it was very very good program strangely it had a, a studio audience now bernard proctor was uh the cousin of bill paley and i think that's interesting because <laughs> neither of these shows were, were done by cbs and he was in, in broadcasting in the 1930s so he had been around for a while mainly on variety programs and he was reading a magazine article um, about uh, Joseph uh, Magic, and the uh, author of of that, or the, the newspaper reporter, uh, was uh, named Jim McGuire, and he helped get uh, Joseph Magic out of jail. It was a case of uh, mistaken identity, and I'll go through that in, in, in more detail, and police intimidation and police corruption. And the story was so good, it eventually became a movie called Northside 77, which I'm sure some of you have seen. But after he read the story about the incident, uh, Proctor became convinced that there are all kinds of stories in these independent newspaper markets. I mean, newspaper business is really regional. There, are, there really weren't any national newspapers at this time. People knew the reporters, but the, the national news business was really Associated Press and, and, and United Press. And so Proctor got this idea that every, every town has a story, every town has a reporter who had a big story of their career, and he wanted to put all of them together. Uh, so they began to solicit stories from reporters, and they, they would visit some of the big newspapers in these towns and interview them and they would come up with the stories and by the time the series got on the air it was such a big hit they were getting about 25 uh ideas for stories and and most of the times the reporters would just send them uh newspaper clippings of of their work and uh that's they had a real lot to to choose from uh proctor really wanted to break the old time radio or at that time it was wasn't old um, stereotype of the newspaper. And as I'm reading this particular directive of his, which was be sure that every reporter is portrayed as he really is, and then not as the stereotyped hard-boiled whiskey swigging news hawk. I think there goes Casey Crime Photographer, my <laughs> my favorite series, and he just flushed it on us. Um, but the big story it really wanted to be real and as as real as they as they could. They all followed a very similar pattern. Um, Proctor got his wish that the reporter is identified as uh, just a normal person who happens to work for a newspaper. They're grinding out uh, a life and a, and a career every day. And then there is a particular event or a particular situation that comes to their attention and they realize that this could be a really important story and they devote um, usually a disproportionate amount of their time uh, to that. They start interacting with the police, uh, anybody affected by uh, the, the events, they talk to the families, they gather the facts and eventually the story becomes their personal mission because no one wants to follow the story. It seems hopeless that there's no real solution. There's no uh, there's no real ending to it. Everything's a dead end. So usually there are two people who have enough fortitude to stick it out, and that's the reporter and a victim uh, family member. Uh, everybody else wants them to stop. Then suddenly uh, they come up with a witness or they find some new evidence that creates an opportunity for insight that only the reporter can have. 
and then the story follows through to its conclusion. Uh, justice is always applied. There's never there's corrections of injustice, um, and there's always some kind of solution where the perpetrator gets their due, or an innocent person is exonerated of, of the crime. But that's a pattern, and. I, I used to complain about, oh, well, all those shows have the same kind of pattern. And then Jack Beck reminded me, well, that's what people want to go to the story for. That's why they tune in. They know that there's a pattern there. They're comfortable with it. And they really want to follow it through. And it's up to the writers to make it interesting, even though the pattern might be the same. Now, at the time in the 1940s and the 1950s, newspapers were an essential part of, of daily life. Most big towns had more than one newspaper. There was a, usually at least one morning paper and one evening paper because TV uh, news in the evening had not started yet. And they could actually see pictures. So this was a benefit of the newspaper compared to radio. On one hand, the radio was very good at allowing people to imagine what a certain situation is going to be. But if you were talking about the news, it was very helpful to see who the actual people were, as opposed to imagining what FDR looked like, for example. Uh, Bob Stepano is on the Old Time Radio Researchers Facebook page very often, and he has a website, and I'll, I'll have a live link to it at the web page that, that we've set up. And uh, he heard this quote, he doesn't know who to attribute it to. But there is a, a certain kind of smugness among newspapers that's legendary about them. And the, the line goes, newspaper men think they meet the most interesting people. And most of them appear to be other newspaper men. But there were actually newspaper writers and journalists and, and researchers and, and editors who had incredible and very heroic uh, careers. And the big story sought to find a lot of those uh, people. The, the morning and the evening papers gave them a chance to have uh, a lot of uh, dynamic things going on within those particular towns as the, as the reporters tried to one-up each other on, on, on having really good coverage of, of the stories. And people were used to having a morning and an evening paper so that they could uh, see how stories were playing out during the day. Uh, one of the reporters or an editor that uh, Big Story uh, focused on was, was uh, Paul Schoenfeld from, of the New York Journal American. And he actually had a formula where in the morning you, uh, you describe the crime. Uh, in the afternoon, because there were also afternoon editions, you, you create speculation as to what really happened, even though you knew it was not possible. And in the evening, you have the solution for it. So people would have to buy at least two newspapers during the day and maybe a third one to get the full story. One of the ways that the big story got some credibility was to have a prize that was given to the reporter. And that was $500. And that was a, a number picked for good reason because at that time, the Pulitzer Prize was $500. So. American Tobacco was giving a reporter the same amount for the Pulitzer Prize, trying to get them to have the same kind of stature for having their story dramatized on the program. Uh, Pulitzer didn't like that, and they later doubled it to $1,000. And American Tobacco didn't have to because it worked. Uh, the, the big story became one of the favorite programs on radio and later television. It's really interesting listening to these stories today and you realize that we couldn't have a lot of these stories in the same manner. Uh, communications now would seem primitive, but uh, only businesses had phones and wealthy uh, people and homes had phones. So the idea that reporters needed access to a phone was kind of new and novel. And uh, you always had the tension of, can they find a payphone to call the story in? Uh, they had to go back to the office or try to call in uh, to the office to uh, get the story taken down, but they really had to be in the office. And a lot of the big story uh, takes place there, the interaction of the editors with other reporters. 
In terms of the crimes, I mean, security video is all over the place uh, today. Uh, DNA technology would have solved a lot of crimes before they even got to big story status. There are lots of uh, scripts that are about mistaken identity. Um, and it's, it's very clear that uh, these kinds of stories would not be happening today. I mean, it, we've gone from the reporter and the detective doing the, the, the hard work of pounding the streets to now so much more occurs in the lab and more people are familiar with this because of TV programs like uh, Crime Scene Investigation. Another thing that uh, is interesting with the stories is, is how accepted and quick the application of capital punishment was. So when we go into the true events, it's not uncommon for someone to be found guilty and then 18 months later for them to be executed. This added another sense of tension in the story that made the reporters work to exonerate somebody all the more important because they were working against the clock. Uh, they, they had to not only find witnesses, it had to be credible witnesses, they had to find uh, evidence that was not really subject to any kind of scientific testing the way they are today. And they had to be convincing not just to their editor, but also to the authorities and in some cases, the governor's office. So uh, this added another sense, another plot aspect that uh, would not necessarily be had today. And then there are some very sad stories uh, where uh, mental illness was not diagnosed and other issues in terms of the perpetrators of the crimes would be addressed today, but they really weren't understood at that time or there was no kind of treatment for them. So they were allowed to uh, continue dysfunctional behavior uh, related to crimes when today they would, would have gotten treatment. One of the people I'll talk about later, just had he been able to get disability and, and not go into an office, probably wouldn't have uh, uh, perpetrated the crime that he had. Uh, so is you're, you're, you're taking a step back into classic radio because we love that, but this has an overlay of history on it that if you understand the context of it, it becomes all the more fascinating. So uh, February 1946, they uh, produce an uh, audition called Feature Assignment. Uh, it was originally going to be called Special Assignment, but uh, on the script that uh, Carl Shadow was uh, able to help uh, secure, you can see that it was changed to Feature Assignment. And it's about that case in Chicago. Um, the case basically went like this. A, a cop is shot when there's a deli robbery, but it turns out it's not really a deli. It's a speakeasy with a deli front that other cops were covering up who were on the take. Uh, they wanted to close the case very quickly, so they found basically three teenagers or, or, or young, young men who they could blame on this, and they in intimidated the owner of the deli to say that this is these are the people she saw. And they threatened her by, uh, uh, by saying that they, they would charge her with bootlegging. So she suddenly becomes a witness who, who's very knowledgeable about everything that went on. People are suspicious about this. The judge tells uh, Magic that um, he believes he was framed, but he can't do anything. The state prosecutor wants this case to stay, to stay down and not, uh, not come up. Uh, so he go, ends up going to jail. Uh, he keeps saying that he's innocent, but nobody believes him. So realizing that he's gonna be in jail for a very long time, he tells his uh, wife, Helen, to divorce him so that she is free to marry and raise a family. In 1941, this is, an, uh, this is nine years after the event and eight years after the, uh, the, the, the trial, his parole request is turned down. So things look very bleak. Then it, at the end of 1944, his mother places an ad in the Chicago Daily Times. And this is, this is the twist on it that made it so interesting, especially for uh, the plot line of Cold North Side 777. 777. The telephone numbers didn't have as many digits at that time. She offered $5,000 as a reward for the real killers. Now, she was a charwoman. 
Uh, she cleaned offices overnight and her husband worked in a Chicago slaughterhouse. So they didn't have a whole lot of money. So they really scraped this up for years and years to offer this reward. Uh, McGuire, the Chicago Times reporter, sees this ad and starts to investigate and he starts to re-interview everybody involved. He's convinced that the story is true, that the mother is uh, is very sincere in, in wanting this done. And so it, uh, he, he decides that, yes, this is, this is a really good case for this. There's a serious wrongdoing that went on here. And he finds out that uh, there was the threat of the bootlegging charge, that there was also testimony that the police hid and also her false testimony. And gradually it worked its way through the system. He is released. The Times, of course, refuses the reward money. And uh, Magic gets $24,000 from the state of Illinois. One of the people who was with him didn't get justice until like another three years later. Uh, but uh, they got $330,000. Um, he remarries the wife. Uh, she had had a, a child with, her, uh, with the other uh, man. And um, unfortunately, he died in 1979 uh, in a car accident. But the story was always being brought up uh, in Chicago. And th there were a lot of uh, uh, law review articles uh, about it and what was done. Uh, on the left-hand side is uh, Joe and his mother, Tilly, who cleaned all those offices. And on the right-hand side is the recorder, reporter, Jim McGuire, uh, Helen, Joe, uh, Jim, and the stepdaughter, uh, Theodora. And um, if you want more information on this particular case, uh, there's lots of uh, resources on it, including uh, a site that I have. So that was the uh, that was the audition, and it languished for a while because this the fourth estate thing was was uh, going on. That didn't gain any traction. And finally, uh, NBC says, we're going to do the big story. We have American Tobacco. They're going to be the sponsor. And um, NBC issues uh, a statement, which basically says, uh, we don't want the program to be horror for horror's sake. We like suspense and intense dramatic values better than cheap substitution of blood curdling and sometimes revolting horror. All right, so first, they got rid of Casey Crime Photographer on me, and now they're telling me that that house in Cypress Canyon is a bad show, okay? <laughs> and then, they, while they have all this feature assignment stuff, they really like it, they changed the title to The Big Story. Now, where did that come from? Well, as, as I'm doing newspaper searches on this, I keep getting searches of a horse named the big story from spring of 1947. And this is a really good horse because it's um, it's been asked to or nominated to go into the Kentucky Derby. And it won a lot of smaller races in, its, in various regions around the country. So every time I'm looking for the big story, I keep coming up with big story, the horse. And it started to make me wonder if in addition to the morning newspaper and the evening newspaper, somebody was reading the daily racing form and seeing this horse named The Big Story doing so well. It's one of those things that we'll never know if it's true, but it seems awfully suspicious to me. My money's on the horse. <laughs> so what's this fictionalization thing? Um, Big Story was concerned about uh, legal issues. They didn't want anybody suing them for misrepresenting the facts or being accused of misrepresenting the facts. So they have this idea, and I, I don't think this is their phrase, but it started to pop up in other places called authentic fictionalization, which sounds like a bureaucratic thing, you know? Um, so telling the truth on the air, you're always going to have a legal risk. I, I've got the same name or this happened to me, you're telling my story, whatever. So this is what they do. They keep the reporter, they keep the uh, reporter's newspaper affiliation, they keep the geography. So that the geography turns out to be a key piece of this in trying to, in trying to uncover the original stories, but they disguise everything else. 
And they also have the task of fitting the story in, into a very short period of time because they have to allow for commercials as part of the 30 minutes and also the introduction and, uh, and their close and, and all that. So it comes out to around 22 to, to 23 minutes. Uh, so there's a lot of composite characters and they want to keep the details in such a way that uh, people will, will see how, the, how everything plays out and then by the end, they're saying, oh, yeah, that's right, because such and such happened. It's, it's, it's interesting to read, read reviews of the program because there are a lot of complaints about the middle commercial interrupting the story, which means that even the critics were fully engaged in the story and wanted to know how it ended, and they stuck a commercial in there. So it was pretty compelling drama for its time. They were always sympathetic to the reporter. The reporter is humble. The reporter is smart. The reporter is good to his dog. The reporter is tenacious. The reporter just loves everybody, okay? Not that there aren't some grumpy reporters. Of course there are. But that was the idea that they were going to make sure the reporter is the hero in the story. Um, this was interesting. They always wanted to make the reporters seem like that they, they were lifelong journalists. And one of the problems researching these stories has been that a lot of the reporters only were in the business two or three or five or seven or 10 years, not for their entire career. Some of them made tremendous uh, career changes. But by the time the story comes on, uh, the big story, you'd never know that that reporter may have had uh, a, a career for the last 15 years, and they just plucked this out of the uh, archives, and the reporter's name is suddenly on it again. So there may have been some very surprised reporters and or ex-reporters who, who found out that their story was going to be on the big story. To move the story along, they used narration. They had lots of different scenes. They, they jump in the timeline, and that's very important. So they got to keep the story simple. They can't really have anything very complex because the story's got to move. Uh, the gruesomeness of some of these crimes is really suppressed. Uh, but the crime can be passed, and, but you still have the victims uh, describing the effects of the crimes, maybe not the details of them. So while they don't show the crime, they are showing the effects of it. Like um, even on uh, TV's original or classic Law and Order, you never see the crime committed. You always see uh, the aftermath of the crime at the beginning of the program. Um, Any time that uh, politicians or law enforcement might look bad, they're really reluctant to show it in that light because uh, not that they have a pledge to keep everybody looking squeaky clean, is that it it complicates the stories. So if there's an, um, an injustice because the wrong person is in jail, that's kind of a given. And it's not always the fault of the justice system or the, uh, or the police. It's often the fault a witness did not come forward or, forward or the witness was intimidated by a gangster or something like that. So it, it's kind of played down a little bit. Uh, there, every every police department has constraints of, of time and, and resources, and unfortunately, they don't always play out in 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 a in the way that people want them to be. No, not even the not even the officers uh, know that they played out the, the way that they would want it to be. But by the end of the story, all the cases are are clean, complete, and justice is appropriately applied. Everything is fine even if it's late. Uh, by the end, uh, like a lot of the movie codes, good triumphs over evil. You can trust the law. And most of all, you can trust the press that they're going to be honest with everything that happens. Now, how do we find the original stories? Uh, thank goodness for newspapers.com. That's our first step. Uh, we have to find the reporter in the newspaper, and that's not always as simple as it sounds because there really weren't bylines at that time. A lot of the reporters who were associated with stories never had a byline for the news that they were reporting because the story was from 
the newspaper. It wasn't from the reporter. Only columnists had bylines. And that gradually changed over the decades. But if you know the newspaper, you can start to suspect that it was a, it was a reporter. Um, you, you can look at almost all of the scripts, and that will give you a lot of clues. They, they were all scanned as part of the American tobacco litigation. They're no longer online anymore, but uh, old-time radio researchers and others downloaded all of those files. Uh, the reason they were in, in the litigation was for the, for the Pell-Mell commercials. Um, so thank goodness all of that is there. It's, it's serving in an, uh, a use that was never anticipated by all the lawyers, uh, but uh, they've been just absolutely terrific for anybody doing research on the series. The next thing to do is to try to find the reporter's obituary and or a retirement story. Now, if the reporter did not have a long career, then their obituary may only barely mention that they had a, a newspaper uh, career. But somebody who's been in the business a long time that usually mentions that their work appeared on the big story. Uh, and it does get a high profile, just like winning, winning a, a Pulitzer Prize would. Um, newspapers.com and other resources don't always have all the newspapers we'd like them to have. So you start looking for stories around the broadcast days. And if it's in the same town, they will often say um, such and such a reporter's story is going to be on the big story this Thursday. And it's about the local story and give you the details of the local story. And that's uh, between the obituaries and that, that's the easiest way to find them. If you can get the name of the perpetrator, even better, because you get a lot of details uh, there. Um, the Crosstown newspapers might cover the stories, but even if, even if the big stories reporter worked for uh, a paper and is no longer in the business, the Crosstown papers will play down that other newspaper and that other reporter. It's, it was really curious, the, the local competition. So here's, here's an example. This is uh, Aubrey Maddock, who had an early uh, big story uh, dramatization called The Final Curtain. Uh, this was the story that uh, became uh, Arsenic and Old Lace. And that story was in 2016. So that was the original date of the crime. And Maddock covered the story as working for the Hartford Current when he was 27 years old. By the time it gets to the big story, it was 31 years after the story and 23 years after the, he left the newspaper business. But he never left Hartford. He became very big in real estate uh, in Hartford. So when he passed away, uh, he was extremely well known in the city. And uh, they, they went through the things that he did in, in the realty business but also they really played up his work as a reporter. So this became very easy to figure out and, uh, what the story was and, and go back to it because it was, was so well reported. But it's an example how there are very few big story stories that are recent, meaning like two or three years. Most of them are like 10 or 15 years earlier than the actual broadcast. The program was produced in New York, and because they're, they have a timeline that they have to cover and a lot of different scenes, they hired many actors and they had them double. This particular program had seven actors and 14 parts. And even the narrator, Bob Sloan, had to double. And the actor playing Harry Kodinsky had to double. So there's always group scenes or things that are occurring in, um, in the newsroom or out in the streets or in a restaurant, whatever, where they always need somebody new, somebody to come by and just say a couple of lines. And that's, uh, that's one thing that's really different. When you look at these scripts, that's one, one thing where they're really different than most other shows. They also made the script phonetic. Many times the... Uh, the characters in radio dramas have relatively simple names so that everybody can pronounce them. Um, 
you know, Lamont Cranston may not be a common name, but when you see it on your script, you're going you're gonna to get it right. Uh, they were always concerned that Pell-Mell, spelled with an A, would be mispronounced on the program. So in the script, they put it in phonetically. And if there was a reporter who had a, um, an, either an ethnic spelling or a special pronunciation, uh, they would put in pronunciation information. And then in this particular case for Frank McCullough, uh, after they would go through the rehearsal and get the name right, uh, they would cross that out in the script so they didn't accidentally say it. But it was important for them to be accurate. After all, this is a news story. Now, uh, I always wondered how the reporters, uh, what their relationship was with the, uh, with the producers and how much they really got and what, what the legal relationship was. Um, there was a program I was really having a tough time looking for. It was, uh, it was a, a murder in Las Vegas and the reporter was John Callan. Uh, and I just couldn't find it. And one day I'm doing a Google search and I found that his papers were at the uh, Nevada State Museum in Las Vegas. So I contacted the research desk there and uh, by email had got a hold of Maggie Bukowski, who's the curator, and asked her about this. And sure enough, she found that there was the contract and some other support materials. So this this is uh, reveals a, a tremendous about, uh, amount about the program. Um, I was in business all of my career from the late seventies until I retired. I never saw a contract this short before about something so important. And all it is, it's a, it's a blank form. And uh, thankfully it gave the, the name of the crime. So finally I had a way of uh, going into newspapers.com and looking for it. Um, the reporter gives them permission to use the name and then he's gonna get a check for 500 bucks. He basically had to do nothing other than let, him, let them use his name. Um, he, he'd get more money if it was used on television. So they, the contract for him was, Contract for radio, if they used it on television, he gets another 100 bucks. So you um, multiply it by 11, so it's $1,100. So he's getting about $5,500 just for use of his name. And then if it's used in the magazine, the big story, and uh, that's a failed magazine, I'll, there was only three issues, I'll, I'll explain that later. But if they turn it into a movie, he's gonna get $5,000 if it's a feature movie. But if it's one of those second uh, features, he's only going to get a thousand bucks. But uh, this is it. this is it. It's signed by the reporter. It gives you his home address and his phone number. Las Vegas only had four digit phone numbers at that time. And I thought it was very curious that it doesn't specify anything about the relationship with the reporter about the production of the scripts. That did happen. Uh, they did have interviews of the reporters by the people who were going to be writing the script so they could get a sense of things. And the reporters sent um, newspaper clippings. Um, this is a letter that the Callan sent to uh, the uh, person responsible for these things at, uh, at Proctor, um, where, where Proctor is misspelled by Callan. Gee, that, um, that's interesting. I just saw that. Um, so he sent them a, a resume of the story, so basically an outline, uh, his autobiography, and copies of the printed stories. And this was in July 1953. It took a, um, about eight months or so. They actually produced it on the show. And on the right-hand side, you can see the letter that he got from the president of American Tobacco. And... Um, it's all puffery and stuff, and, and there's the check. And then as a lasting memento of your distinguished service to journalism, you got a bronze plaque that everybody would ooh and ah about in your office, assuming, of course, you were still in the newspaper uh, business. This was a very interesting story, and while they fictionalized it, most of the facts are there. There are some stories 
where they uh, you, you can barely recognize it. There's one I'll, I'll explain. It's, it's it's like it's a totally different story. So uh, there were some uh, railroad railroad workers at uh, Union Pacific in uh, in Las Vegas, and uh, one of them was met, had a wife. So that was Wayne and his wife Evelyn. They're riding with a coworker to go outside of town, and uh, Wayne thinks that uh, Galen has been fooling around with Evelyn, and Wayne shoots uh, Galen in front of Evelyn. Then they decide to drive back home uh, into town. That must have been a very interesting ride, unfortunately. And then he he parks the car. Uh, they have a conversation, and he kills her. And then he walks to the train station. And uh, there he sees a co-worker, uh, Charles Decker. Um, he, he was just over the Decker's house a, a couple of nights before, and he shoots him. Then he goes into a bar to contemplate everything is, he's done, have a couple of drinks, and the, probably to say how satisfying all that was. And then the police come. And he, he threatens uh, everyone in there uh, in, in the bar and the police want to shoot him, but there's a, a, a bartender who might be accidentally in the way. So the police don't shoot. They do get an angle to run toward him, but he commits suicide before the officer can stop him. Then they found Gilmore's body. Um, and uh, that was done by some people who were driving out into the outskirts of town and are trying to, to get a grasshopper out of the car and they stumble across the body, which is very interesting. That's a, it's probably a weekend they'll be talking, they were talking about for quite a while. Um, and that was the story. And uh, this is broadcast in 1954. And you see the actual story occurred in 1941. And it was, it's pretty well intact. Uh, one of the worst adaptations was when uh, Walter Winchell's uh, work to bring uh, gangster Louis Lepke into uh, the FBI uh, was dramatized. Uh, this was put in the wash a couple of times. Uh, Lepke was already dead, and I don't know why they didn't uh, uh, make it a little more graphic, but... Uh, there, it's a cor the cornered cat refers to the time that Lepke was hiding out from the police and and uh, other folks who were around together, and it's it sounds so benign that uh, you you think it was parking tickets that he had done. Um, you don't get a real sense of the story until you listen to the uh, Dot Records uh, LP release, which was popular because Winchell was narrating the Untouchables at the time. Uh, if you listen to that and then listen to this uh, big story, you'll sense quite a difference. Uh, one reporter, Ray Spriegel from um, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, was a, was a real legendary reporter. And uh, he was very disappointed with the way that they had adapted his story. And uh, he told the, the newspaper critic of the paper, that the true story would have story would have been a lot more interesting and effective and, and powerful, and uh, the newspaper uh, television critics said that the big story was one of the worst shows on television, um, and because he he knew a lot of the inside stuff that was going on. So the way it was cleaned up was there's a guy in Earth unjustly jailed, his uh, request for parole are always denied. The ex-wife. Uh, and that was a little twist in the story. The ex-wife was going with information to, to try to get him released, not to, that she had any intention of uh, getting back together with him. And they, uh, the reporter and an attorney start to go through the details of the case, and they find some perjury. They get a new confession, and the husband is released. The real story was a little bit more complex. Uh, the prosecutors wanted to get rid of this case and they were actively coaching witnesses during the trial. The person, Paul Boggs, didn't have enough money to hire his own attorney. So he used the same attorney as, as the guy he was with who actually did the murder. Uh, so he's kind of left in the back and, and not getting proper representation from, from the attorney. And uh, he did the attorney did keep his uh, client out of the electric chair, but Boggs got 
got swept into jail just as uh, just like he did. The there was a cover up of uh, among witnesses and uh, who who actually worked on the crime and could exonerate Boggs, but they did not because they were they were threatened, and the prosecutors just didn't want to go near the case anymore. So by the time that Spriegel had done his work with with the lawyers, there was a period of time when the correct criminal was in jail and down a few cells from Paul Boggs, who was still in jail unjustly. He was eventually released, wanted nothing to do with the, his, his uh, family, unfortunately. Um, you know, he was appreciative, but uh, he went uh, directly to the draft board and went into, into the military and... Uh, and despite everything that happened to him, became a first-class uh, soldier in that uh, regard. This next one was an absolute mess. Um, many of you know the name Max Ehrlich, who wrote thousands of radio scripts. I, I don't think that's an outlandish number to, to, to think of. And he probably had a story. He wrote for The Shadow. So he's probably thinking of, of weird stories that could work on The Shadow. And he gets this uh, this story written by Stuart Whitehouse in Seattle. Um, and I knew something was wrong when I went to the back page of the script and heard it on, on the recording that tonight's program was adapted by Max Ehrlich from an actual story from the front pages of the West Seattle Herald, which basically means headline. And what is the headline? A woman is dead, murdered in her apartment. And then Ehrlich seemed to take it from there. Um, the story that Ehrlich used, and it may have been from a different series that he just reused here, um, it seems a little different. An out of work magician meets a, a young divorcee in a bar. He thinks they're getting along. They go to, to her apartment. He does some magic tricks. She doesn't like the tricks. She doesn't like him. He gets angry. He strangles her with a yo-yo cord, and police are baffled until they eventually figure out that it's a yo-yo cord. That's the fictionalized story. The real story is that this was a brutal murder of a socialite uh, by her husband who bludgeoned her with a closet rod. She was in the news because she was the second wife of the, of the husband. He had a very high profile divorce in San Francisco, a society of divorce uh, five years before. And then in, in a scene that you'd think you'd see in, in, a, in a movie or in television today, he's beaten her and she still says, kiss me goodbye, I'm dying. And that scene is not in the, in, in the script. Um, Police start to piece together. That's the husband who did it. They go back to the murder scene. And then eventually he starts getting very talkative about how he got rid of the murder weapon and, and the like. He decides to plead innocent. His attorney quits. Whatever happens, he's convicted and then uh, dies in 1943. That's slightly different than a yo-yo cord. Um, Stuart Whitehouse was really hard to track down. He worked for the West Seattle Herald, but he, he went from writing job to writing job and was a very prolific detective magazine writer. I did find where the archives were for the West Seattle Herald, but I'm trying to, to give them search terms like magician, uh, strangled with a cord and, and stuff like that, and nothing is, is coming up. And of course, because Max Ehrlich had a script that he couldn't use somewhere else, so he put it here. And then of course is the reused script the big story about the lottery uh, gimmicks in Atlanta by Keeler McCarthy, who was a uh, McCartney, who worked uh, for the uh, Atlanta Constitution, uh, was a, a legitimate story. Um, it's called the lottery there, but it, growing up in New York, it's the numbers. You know, so, so people are betting in bars and it's a, it's a big money maker for, for, for uh, organized crime. And Gail Ingram, writes a script for it. And then, so that's on the chart on the right-hand side. Uh, Harry, her husband, they collaborated often on a series called Tales of Fatima um, and other, other things. And um, he needed a script for Casey Crime Photographer for which he had written before. So they pulled this one out of the file and he changes, changes it. 
So this chart shows um, the different pieces of the story. The dialogue is very, very similar for, for much of the script. And uh, uh, so they went through item by item and just changed the names and locations and, um, and, and all. And uh, the Casey story is very good. The big story is very good. And uh, someone at the Cobalt Club uh, said, you know, I, I was posting Casey programs at the time. And then by one the time I got to the big story, they said, you know, you better look at this. So I did. Um, I can't speak highly enough about all the friends at the Cobalt Club and how much they help in this research. We've got some marvelous people who listen to the programs with, with great intent uh, and, and the level of intensity that I, I don't normally have. So it's really great to, to work with them. Um, Harry Ingram unfortunately passed away not long after the Casey program uh, was was broadcast. Um, he died in a in a fire in some landscaping work at his home. Um, Gail uh, moved to Hollywood and became a writer uh, mainly for television, and also became a mentor for uh, women who were looking to break into script writing and other aspects of uh, of television and movies. Uh, so they're a very interesting couple, very important couple in the history of radio, especially New York radio. Uh, the conviction re uh, reversal story is uh, is very common here. And again, we don't have DNA. We don't have security cameras. We don't have a lot of uh, crime lab uh, stuff. So uh, what happened uh, here, this is in, in Cleveland. Um, a store is robbed. They run out of the store. A bank guard comes out of the bank. And uh, he looks threatening, so they kill him. And they blame uh, someone who wasn't even in town, a fellow named John Kaczynski, because they somehow had found out that when he went on the road as a band leader, he had changed his name. So that made him guilty of, I guess, almost every crime that they couldn't solve. Um, he wasn't in, in Cleveland at that time. And... Uh, his wife obviously became very upset and uh, frustrated with this. She starts researching everything herself. And it turns out it was yet another case of, uh, of intimidation, this time by the perpetrators of the crime, the ex-cons who had uh, tried to rob that store. Uh, Kaczynski gets in touch with, uh, uh, with Howard Buffet, and uh, they they find one of the people in jail arrested for something else. Um, and they, they start realizing that something's going on here and he refused to talk. And uh, they did find the original witness. Uh, they convinced her that she was safe because this guy was in jail and then she admitted that she was intimidated all the way. And uh, he was paroled for manslaughter but he was not pardoned. I think that was that was very interesting. Somebody was trying to save face there. He got no compensation uh, from Ohio, and uh, they just basically packed up and moved to the West Coast. I, I couldn't find where, where they went. Um, this is a sad one. This one is a real cover-up of a mental illness in the story called The, the Mind of the Little Boy. Um, takes place um, in, in Utah, and um, this is the way it's sanitized. Um, this, this would be the description of the TV guide. Let's put it that way. A maladjusted, immature stalker has crying fits. He kills three people because he was spurned by one of them who was a widowed woman. And he murders victims because they were mean to him. And um, he, he ends up uh, sitting in a diner crying when they, when they, when they catch him. The real story is is almost in, it's just incredibly bizarre. Uh, it's, it's a man named Pascal Boyer, uh, who at some sometimes goes by the name of George Rutledge. He's called the pig because he was he was a butcher. Um, he had a history of brain injuries and mel mental illness that started uh, when scaffolding fell on him in 1928 and was unconscious for three days. You, you think, gosh, they would have done an MRI on this uh, poor man's uh, brain and found something. But um, all they know was that he had constant headaches, he had heavy aspirin use. He would be in the office, people would give him aspirin, everybody had aspirin in his desk for, uh, for him because they knew he was always taking it. 
and he starts getting very absent-minded. He just can't remember things that had happened even just minutes before. He's forgetting people. He's forgetting tasks that he's done. Um, and the doctors kept telling him to rest. So they moved to Colorado. There he gets hit with an iron bar, leaving a dent in his skull. And um, of course, he's not getting any better from this. Um, his absent-mindedness it gets so bad that he would be having dinner at home with his wife and forget that she was there. He kept thinking that she had just walked in, in the door, even though they were together for hours. He finally gets diagnosed with amnesia and something called epileptic automatism, which is um, something that happens with people with, with ep epilepsy, where they can lose track of things and uh, lose context and then not be able to re recall things. I know that I'm not giving an accurate description of it, but this is what, what he had. So he goes on this killing spree of these, uh, of these three people and uh, the cop is, is notified that he's there because they're, they're looking for him. And the cop goes in faking being um, drunk. And that's the way he sneaks up on him. He, a Boyer thinks that he's, he's a drunk guy in, in the diner and the cop grabs him right there. And eventually it goes into court and he knows that something's wrong with him. And, and he says in the court, it would be unwise to turn me loose. He's uh, judged insane. I mean, what took them so long? And he dies months later of a heart condition. So this really didn't help anybody. I mean, um, one of the reasons that he, that you'll read uh, capital punishment being justified is the satisfaction that you, you caught somebody. Nobody even got that um, out of this. Um, so uh, unfortunately, three people died because of the uh, the lack of knowledge about the mental illness and uh, lack of men of uh, of medical imaging and, and the like. Uh, this was a, a situation where uh, the big story was soothed by uh, a person who learned that the, their, her story was going to come up on the show. So she got a lawyer and decided, no, you're not, because I'm going to sue you. You can't show this uh, story and or, or perform this story. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, she murdered her family, uh, her husband and, and, and two kids. And um, she claimed it was in self-defense that she killed the husband after he killed the, the kids. Uh, but she eventually con confessed and was convicted. And then when this uh, program is coming to the air almost nine years later, suddenly she's claiming a right to privacy, uh, which I, I think is a kind of amusing. Um, in a cynical kind of way, because she got a lot of publicity for killing her family. And then that the broadcast would cause her harassment, ridicule, and, and hum humiliation in jail. So <laughs> it's, it's just kind of very, very strange. She sued the writer of the story, the local station, and others. Uh, her name in the story is Ida Wojcik. And um, it doesn't sound anything like that. It does sound ethnic, like her last name of Kalinich, uh, but um, it was protected in that way. It goes to court, and it, just hours before broadcast time, and that uh, NBC was going to preempt the show in Flint, Michigan, where the crime uh, basically occurred and where, where she was. And um, the program did air. The judge refused to do anything because it was from New York. It was not from Flint. He had no really no no um, authority in, in this area, and it had used all kinds of fictitious names. She claimed that she was still going to sue some more. It never uh, never came up again. So it almost looks like, uh, hey, remember me? I'm the one the story is about. Like maybe she was looking for a book deal or something. They, they didn't do book deals at that time. Um, and then there are some heartwarming uh, stories. Uh, one is uh, by uh, Virginia Marmaduke and her photographer, uh, Joseph Kordick from the Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, Marmaduke had a very long career and was, a, was very well known in all Chicago political and social uh, circles. Um, and she would often do stories where people, where she thought people were getting a, uh, a raw deal. 
And in this particular case, there was a baby who had a rare birth defect, which they don't mention on the show, but they mention in the newspapers. Um, part of the urinary system, including the bladder, were outside the body. Uh, so an operation was needed to return it or bring it inside the body. And this was um, at that time and would still be today, a difficult operation. And there was always danger of, of having um, ch children go under anesthesia for such kind of, of surgeries. Well, uh, the debate over whether or not, not to have the sur surgery separated the, uh, the parents. And uh, there were, uh, they were just, uh, they just could not get along. They could not live in the same house and the baby was kind of caught in the middle. So Marmaduke finds out about this. So she starts contacting doctors and eventually comes up with somebody in another state who had uh, a child with the same condition and had the surgery and were very pleased by it and incredibly happy about it. So it, it, it took a while, but uh, that's the nature of this, this story. The search that saved the life refers to finding that other, other family. Um, and I did search around for the, uh, for the person. Uh, the first time I searched a couple of years ago, uh, she was living in Texas and seems like she's now living in Louisiana and she's in her mid seventies. So uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, this other story was about Dorothy Patterson um, who wrote for the Patterson, New Jersey morning call as Penny Pennington. And uh, she found a, a, a young boy, Johnny McDermott, who had a disease that needed some extremely expensive uh, treatment. So she was told the story uh, by the doctors and the family. And then she told the story to the readers and she asked for people to send in money. Well, they were overwhelmed by the amount of money that came in and was coming in even from out of state. So it started to go into a fund called the Save a Child Fund. And they would hold the uh, dances and competitions and all, all kinds of events through the years to raise money for other children who, who needed this. And at the end of this particular broadcast, you can hear Johnny McDermott uh, thank people for, uh, for everything that was done for him and that he was doing well. Now, the magazine, um, they, were, they thought they could really build a big franchise of having a radio television and print and the magazine didn't do all that well it was it's it's interesting i have i have a copy um and uh i saw that the editor was walter b gibson i said wait a second that's the guy who made the shadow and it was um gibson was was a good writer a very very good writer and he wrote very fast um uh, he would write a, an entire shadow novel over a span of four days. Um, and so they would give him show scripts and he would develop a novel or a short story from them. And then they would take photos from the TV kinescopes or if it was a radio program, they would go into a, a photographic studio and hire uh, models to be whatever illustrations they wanted for the crime. So they weren't going to go with uh, with line drawings. They were going to go with photographs to make it seem uh, more up to date. And this was also a place where uh, you could see, I hope you can see that, where you could see the the um, the reporters. They were always were, were trying to, to push the reporters. And um, you, you'd think that it was would be a good deal. So it came out for three months, October, November, and December of 1951, and then it ended. And it was a it was a home office business. So this, Yonkers was not where Walter B. Gibson lived. That's probably where the uh, where the publisher uh, lived, and uh, it was just operated out of there. And it, it just never never took off. But all three three are around. I got a really bad copy. I think I, I paid ten bucks for that. Um, the television program did very, very well, um, even it, in its early years. Uh, you can see here from uh, uh, summer of 1950 ratings, it was number six in the country in terms of percentage of TV homes. Um, it became a very long-running franchise. It uh, 
was one of the few shows to have very good on location filming and studio work. So they would send out a crew to go film the actual locations, the diners, where, where the crime occurred and, and the various homes and all that. And they often got the newspaper coverage for doing that locally. Uh, they would use local people, for instance, to walk the streets and go past stores and, and all that. Um, the same fictionalization guidelines would be there. And occasionally, because it was television, uh, the reporter, the actual reporter would appear at the end of the broadcast. The reporter did not play themselves, but they would appear at the end. And um, in the case of somebody who was freed because of the work of the reporter, they might appear then as, as well. Uh, you do have a mix of, of scripts. The, the radio scripts actually do pretty uh, well in terms of being adapted. There aren't that many uh, recordings. There are two on YouTube and one at uh, University of Georgia, and I have links to those on, on the web page. Um, there's about another, there's six that are on a DVD that you can buy through Amazon. It's not available. No, I, it's not available on Amazon, but if you search online for a big story DVD, you can get six episodes. And there's about another four or five that the people have been finding, most of them from the um, syndicated uh, series. Um, I'm at the end of my tour. So, um, there's a lot more big story to be found. Um, it seems to be getting a little bit more interest as people hear about some of the real life stories that are behind them and that some more stories or more recordings are out. I mean, when I started collecting, I think there were only about eight or nine. Now there's 50. I mean, that's a, that's a big jump. There's never been a big disc uh, run discovery like you have of, uh, of so many other series. Uh, we, you know, there's a lot of the CBS series. We have long runs, but not really for NBC. We keep hoping that uh, something will, will show up somewhere. There may be some at Library of Congress where uh, there are a lot of NBC uh, recordings, but we, we don't really know. And if it's, if, if it's there, but nobody can have access because they haven't been cataloged or transferred, then, you know, they're, they're kind of not there. Um, the, the series didn't have a big star so there's no interest in the program because, oh, I, I like the way Frank Lovejoy does Nightbeat. So it has, has to be carried from a different perspective. Um, also, newspapers have fallen a lot. I think the average home now gets something like 0.2 newspapers a day. So many uh, people are now relying on the internet uh, for uh, getting their news and being able to do a deep dive into many stories about the same thing. Um, the um, we're working hard to get better sounding recordings. Um, we're we're trying to find through all these real collections that we're transferring, trying to find more recordings closer to the original discs and save them as FLAC as opposed to to MP3 files. That seems to be going pretty well, but we're not finding all fifty of them. So I would ask uh, you to tell others in the club and anybody else you run into that the big story is a good show. <laughs>